Good morning. Welcome to Dalewood Baptist Church. It's so good to see each and every one of you here this morning. I know it's a holiday weekend. We've got a few people out of town, uh, but we're just so thankful for all of you who are here today. Uh, I know we've got some people battling illness, too. It's just been one of those weeks, but uh, it's just good to, uh, to be able to worship together with you this morning. Um, I'm just excited for our time of worship together, and I know that we're going to have a, a great morning of worship. So thanks for being here. Um, let's go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing a couple of songs together. We're going to start with one uh, called Only King Forever. So I'd love it if you would stand and sing with me as we sing this together. come to our time of prayer this morning. We, uh, of course, we, I won't go through announcements. Jonathan mentioned those earlier, uh, later on, but uh, either way, we want to lift up uh, both our Junes this morning, June Abney and June Ballard, are both in my Sunday school class, and 
June Ballard had a fall this week. She ended up going ahead and having some of the kids, I think, over Thanksgiving on Thursday. But uh, she's bruised up, got a lot of surface uh, bruising on, on one side, whole, all down one side of her body. Uh, June Abney, we want to continue to remember her. June, uh, January the 4th, I'm sorry, December the 4th. Uh, she has some further skin ca cancer surgery. We want to pray for her. June, are you in here? Okay, okay, I was looking on the wrong side. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, speaking of surgery, we want to continue to lift up Debbie Keller. Debbie, is, uh, as I mentioned last week, she's going to retire at the end of the year, but uh, we want to pray for her. She had some skin cancer uh, surgery a couple of weeks back. Are there any others uh, anybody wants to share? Uh, just a recent prayer request anybody wants to share before we go to the Lord in prayer. Frank, Frank, been thinking about you, buddy. Good. Glad you're here. Let's give him a round of applause. Okay. And, uh, I'm still waiting on your phone call back. <laughs> that, that suffices just you being here with us this morning, so. God is good. All righty. With these uh, that we've mentioned, uh, we want to pray for the the time that uh, right now that Israel and Hamas are out of a break to try to let some of the people, the hostages, come across. And we know that they're dragging that out all week long, but uh, we want to pray for that uh, to come about well. We pray that hopefully all of them will be released as, they, the, as the days come ahead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we do thank you, Lord, for how you've blessed us in every way. We thank you for these names we've mentioned this morning. Father, we know that you know every situation of physical healing that needs to come about. We thank you for Frank being here with us, Father. Thank you for his restoration, Lord. And Father, we're just mindful of how you uh, work in our lives every day. You've called us to love you and to be obedient to you, Father. So help us to do that. Help us that to be our focus from this day forward. Father, we thank you for our time of thanksgiving this Thursday as we celebrate it together. Father, we need to be mindful of the thankfulness that we have every day in our lives for everything. From small to large, Father, we're grateful to you of how you bless us and show us your pathway. So, Father, just... Uh, <coughs> Continue to bless us today. Be with uh, Jonathan as he brings our message this morning. Jason as he brings our message. Father, just continue to bless us and show us your pathway to all of the acknowledgement of who you are as our continual Lord and Savior. In Christ's name we ask all this today. Amen. Thank you, Steve. As we continue to worship together through song, uh, we know that there are a lot of prayer requests and needs in our congregation, and we're thankful for uh, answered prayers. Uh, thankful to have Frank back with us this morning and for other prayers that have been answered, too. But we know that some of you come with heavy hearts this morning, and regardless of where you are and where you've been this week, you know, we've had a time of thankfulness and thanksgiving, but we also know that uh, there are still things that we uh, have on our hearts as we pray for those. And uh, this next song, I, I hope, speaks into that as we sing, Lord, I need you. I'd love for you to stand and and sing this with me, and just to remember that uh, every hour that we need God, our one defense, our righteousness, my God, how I need you. So would you stand, and let's sing this together. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Our gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we come here to praise, honor, and glorify your holy name. We pray for these tithes and offerings. May they be used to further your kingdom. We always want to pray for the gift and the giver. Always give from the heart, and everything we have is yours, Lord. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated as we take our offering together. Would you sing with me? How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The 
the God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah, praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah, death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. Yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living All right. Well, take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Genesis 16. We, we wrap up this series today, um, the mission and the message of God, the mission and the message revealed again. We've been walking through different passages in Genesis and then other Old Testament passages, just getting kind of the, the feel of what the mission and the message of God is and how that involves us, how that involves Israel, how that involves other nations. And, and uh, today we'll wrap that up and kind of dive into to a bit of a plot twist, if you will, um, in the way that, that, this, uh, that this all goes. But to start out, I thought we would read two passages, one in chapter 16, one in chapter 21, and, uh, and get a feel for the context here before we dive in. And so Genesis 16, uh, verse 1, and then we'll look also in chapter 21. And I hope you all had a great Thanksgiving, and um, we did. Uh, it, you know, it's a beautiful time for some. It can be a heavy time for others if they've lost loved ones. And, and so, obviously, we want to be mindful of that. But we were thankful um, for a sweet time. We got to go and see my dad, and, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a gift because he... Um, 
was more present than he has been in a while. He, he was engaging with the kids, and um, he suffers from Alzheimer's, which I think you've heard me mention before. And so, um, so it just was a sweet gift. Uh, as he's been declining significantly, it just was a sweet gift to watch the kids engage. And so thankful for that. I hope it was a sweet time uh, for you guys as well in your time. Genesis 16, verse 1. It says, Abram's wife, Sarai, had not borne any children for him, but she owned an Egyptian slave named Hagar. Sarai said to Abram, since the Lord has prevented me from bearing children, go to my slave. Perhaps through her I can build a family. And Abram agreed to what Sarah said. So Abram's wife, Sarai, took Hagar Her Egyptian slave gave her to her husband Abram as a wife for him. This happened after Abram had lived in the land of Canaan ten years. He slept with Hagar and she became pregnant. When she realized that she was pregnant, she treated her mistress with contempt, Sarah. Then Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for my suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and ever since she saw that she was pregnant, she's treated me with contempt. May the Lord judge between me and you. Abram replied to Sarai, here, your slave is in your hands. Do whatever you want with her. Then Sarah mistreated her so much that she ran away from her. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? She replied, I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, you must go back to your mistress and submit to her mistreatment. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your offspring, and they will be too many to count. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, You've conceived and will have a son. You'll name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your cry of affliction. This man will be like a wild donkey. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand will be against him. He'll live at odds with all his brothers." So she called the Lord who spoke to her, the God who sees, or El Roy. For she said, in this place have I actually seen the one who sees me? That's why she named the spring, a well of the living one who sees me. It's located between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar gave birth to Abram's son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son Hagar had. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. And then flip over to chapter 21. We won't walk back through this entire passage, so I wanted to read it for context. But look at verse 1 there. It says, The Lord came to Sarah, notice her name has been changed, As he had said, (coughs) excuse me, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time God had told him. Abraham named his son who was born to him, the one Sarah bore to him, or Isaac. When his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded Remember the covenant uh, passage that we read. Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made me laugh, and everyone who hears will laugh with me. She also said, who would have told Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I've borne a son for him in his old age. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham held a great feast on the day Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son mocking the one Hagar, the Egyptian, had borne to Abraham. So she said to Abraham, Drive out this slave with her son, for the son of this slave will not be a co-heir with my son Isaac. 
Now this was a very difficult thing for Abraham because of his son. But God said to Abraham, don't be concerned about the boy and your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her because your offspring will be traced through Isaac. But I'll also make a nation of the slave's son because he is your offspring. Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a water skin, put them on Hagar's shoulders and sent her and the boy away. She left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she said, I can't bear to watch the boy die. So as she sat nearby, she wept loudly. God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What's wrong, Hagar? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. Get up, help the boy up, and support him, for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy, and he grew. He settled in the wilderness and became an archer. He settled in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your love, for your gospel. Thank you for Jesus. Help us, Lord, to see like you see. Help us to know and trust that you are with us. Help us to sense that you have a mission and a message to be fulfilled and delivered. And you're still writing this story. We're a part of it. May our hearts be broken and may our eyes have vision as you continue to invite us along into this mission and this message with you. We surrender this time to you. May I be hidden in you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So I think I've told you this before, but one of my favorite and probably most intriguing passages of Scripture that I personally have ever read is in Joshua. Joshua uh, took over from Moses, right? They, they came out of the land of Egypt, and here they were to go into the promised land. And Moses passes the mantle of leadership to Joshua. And Joshua was young. He probably even felt some insecurities uh, because he was met with mercy from the Lord in the way that God over and over again repeated to him, don't be afraid, I'm with you. And in, in that declaration, saying to Joshua, I'm with you, right? It, it, it's just this beautiful idea that Emmanuel, God with us, is our real security, is our real hope, our real identity. And this really crazy thing happens, right? They're about to go into the land and, and they come to Jericho. And you know the story well, right? Like I, if you've grown up in any church background and had any children's Bible lesson, you probably heard the story of Jericho. About how they came and here was this fortified city and Joshua had no idea how they were to get through, to get in, to overcome He felt like they were going to be outnumbered, like they weren't going to be strong enough to make it. And God gives them this crazy plan, right? I mean, who knew that the engineering of the walls just wasn't that good, right? That walking around seven times and blowing trumpets would make them fall down. But God did, and God calls, and in his power, makes them able to do something that they certainly could not have done by themselves. But in a moment 
of worry, of concern. And if you've ever been a leader, you know what it feels like to carry the weight of leadership. Joshua walks out from the camp one night. And he's walking out into the, a, a, a barren area there in the wilderness. And he comes upon someone that the scriptures describe as the, 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 the general of the angel armies. Now, we don't fully understand what all is going on here and how all this works. But I think it's safe to say, based on plenty of passages of scriptures, that there is a battle or a war raging between a group of angels who have rebelled and the angels who've remained faithful to Yahweh. And here is Joshua, and he sees this general of the angel armies, and he bows down to him. It says that he fell on his face before him, and he asks him this question. He says, are you for us or for our enemy?" And the general of the angel armies says back to him, neither. And that's not what you were expecting to hear. It's not what Joshua was hoping to hear. Now, the answer did not mean that Jericho would not come and become theirs. The answer did not mean that, that they would not do what God empowered them to do and they would not take the, the answer. It did not mean that God wasn't with them. The answer did not mean that God had not chosen them. The answer did not mean that God didn't have favor on them. But the answer had an implication to it, saying to Joshua that what I'm doing, Joshua, is bigger than just you and Jericho. What I'm doing is bigger than that. I'm not for either. I'm for both. And you see that in the complexity of the Old Testament story. You see it in Jonah's story. This crazy idea that God would love Israel and Jonah and yet have the same love and compassion and offer forgiveness to Nineveh. And you see it over and over and over again throughout multiple stories in the Old Testament. And then you even see it in the Gospel of Mark very clearly as people who were not Israelites respond in faith to Jesus. And on one particular occasion, he says, there is not greater faith in Israel than yours when speaking to a Roman centurion. And so in the complexity of this crazy story, we have to wrestle with the idea that the mission and the message of God is bigger than you, than me, than any one people, that what he's doing isn't just about one group, but about the nations. As we read just two weeks ago when he said, you profane my name, but I will make it holy again for my name's sake and for the glory of my name among the nations. Now what I don't want you to hear this morning, I'm not saying Israel's not chosen or someone else is. Israel is chosen. And there's plenty of scriptures that back that up. All I want us to do is get the context of what the conflict is really about and what God is up to that's even larger in its scope than the conflict that we see even now in the news. And so it's a family feud of sorts. And this plot twist occurs. And here's the plot twist, spoiler alert, right? The mission of God came about through one nation, Israel, who then delivered a message to many nations through Jesus and his followers, most of them Jews. And God is then inviting them to become one nation, all of the nations to become one nation with whom he would dwell. You might say, how could you say that? Well, read Ephesians. Ephesians makes it plain. 
Paul writes that this is the mystery of God, that he is making the Jews and the Gentiles into one nation, a new humanity of sorts, and God, Jesus himself, will dwell with them. That this is the work that he's up to. And yet in the midst of this, we have this crazy family feud. And it isn't just with Ishmael and his brothers, it's even with Ishmael and his stepbrother. Right? Isaac. And so the, the feud is a family feud. That, that's the context. I mean, this is millennium years old. Right? This is thousands upon thousands of years old in its, in its, in its origin as to when this conflict came about. But what I want us to hear this morning is... I want us to process who is God for? And what does that mean for us? Who is he for? And what does that mean for us? The first thing I want you to understand as we process the idea of who is God for (coughs) is let's think about how God sees Look again back at Genesis 16, specifically at verse 9. So Hagar has been mistreated here, and you could see this coming, right? Like this this is almost uh, a script for a soap opera, right? Like like you could see this coming, and, and so it doesn't end well. And Sarah gets, gets her feelings deeply hurt, and rightly so. And yet it was of her own doing. Right? And so, so this is what's crazy. And, and we don't, I think, I know we will understand this, but in that culture, if you were barren as a woman, you were considered not to have the favor of God. And, and so that's what's happening here. Is Sarai is struggling to believe the promises of God because in her culture and the surrounding cultures, a barren woman meant God or whoever that culture's gods were that they were not looked upon favorably. They were not blessed. And so that's the struggle here is Abraham goes in with Hagar and then she gets pregnant. Right? And so this, this cultural dynamic is at play that Hagar now looks like the blessed one and not Sarai. And the struggle that ensues from that. So she mistreats Hagar, and Hagar is prideful, as the text says. She begins to even have contempt toward her mistress, right? Almost like, hmm, I'm the one blessed, right? Like, you, you thought you were blessed. I'm the one blessed here. But she's so mistreated that she leaves. And here's the plot twist. The angel of the Lord found her, verse 9. The angel of the Lord said to her, you must go back to your mistress and submit to her mistreatment. That, that was not the news I think Hagar wanted to hear. What's interesting here, though, is this is the very first time in all of Scripture that the angel of the Lord appears to someone. It won't be the last, right? You probably, even right now, can think of other times when the angel of the Lord appeared. I just told of one a minute ago Mary is probably the one that most prominently comes to mind. And yet in this moment, the first time the angel of the Lord, which by the way, in the Hebrew text, most scholars suggest if they are Christ followers, if they're Jesus believers, that Jesus is the Messiah, most scholars who are Jesus followers suggest that in the Hebrew text, any time the angel of the Lord is mentioned like this, It's some form of reference to the incarnate Jesus. And so some would even say that this is the first time Jesus 
isn't mentioned because he's mentioned in Genesis, right? In Genesis 3. Remember, that was the beginning. This is the mission and message of God revealed again. Remember, the first message in this series was from Genesis 3 when Jesus and that mission and message were revealed the first time, right? But, but here, <coughs> excuse me, here he shows up. He shows up and he visits Hagar, an Egyptian slave who has Ishmael, who most scholars believe is the father of the Arab people. Not everyone, there are those who debate that, but most believe in the way that Ishmael's ancestry is traced that the, that the nomadic Arab people who become the people that we know about today in the majority of the Middle East can trace their line back to Ishmael. Which means they can trace their line back to Abraham. So hold that thought for a moment because that, I think, is really significant in the prophecy that we'll read to close. But here, God sees Hagar. God sees Ishmael. He doesn't just see Abram and Sarai. He sees them. And, and look at what she says in verse 13. So she called the Lord who spoke to her, the God who sees. Right? Who does this sound like? What apostle? Do you remember the, the apostle who, who says to Jesus, you saw me under the fig tree. Right? He's quoting an Old Testament passage. He's basically saying, you are the God who sees. And here's Hagar the first time saying, you are the God who sees and you saw me. And I think the challenge to us as we think about that question, who is God for? Is we have to answer that at least remembering how and who God sees. Because the truth is that he sees all of us. There are countless, I mean countless, Old Testament passages that describe his desire for the nations. Not just one nation. And yet he chose one nation to bring that mission and message And in the scope of that, God sees that one nation, Israel, and the nations that he desires to write into his story and into his family as well. The second thing I want us to think about, flip over to chapter 21, is not only that God sees, but as we're thinking about who is God for, to understand who God is with. Right, and this is really interesting. Skip into verse 17. And again, again, same conflict here. Sarai now is Sarah. She now has had a child. She's not barren. She feels that favor and that blessing. And for whatever reason, and you know how kids are. I mean, this happens in our house daily, right? Happened yesterday. As we're trying to decorate, right? Isn't that, I mean, you love it, don't you? You love, we're decorating for Christmas, happiest time of year, and there's significant sibling conflict, right? And yet in this sibling conflict, it leads to something very disastrous. And Abraham, you can see in the text, his heart is broken. And yet he sends Hagar and Ishmael away. In verse 17, it says, God heard the voice of the boy. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven this time and said, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. Get up, help the boy, support him. I'll make him into a great nation. Do you realize he says to, to her the first passage we read, I'll make him into a great nation. He's, he's speaking a blessing over them. And here he's speaking another blessing over them. There's even a passage where it describes the fact that, that he will look after this people. And I think it's incredibly significant that he then says, get up, help the boy. And then verse 19, then God opened her eyes. 
and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. So interesting that Jesus uses similar methodology the first time he steps out of the Jewish culture with the message and the mission of God and sits at a well, a spring of living water with a Samaritan woman. Listen, you know this because you've heard missionaries speak about it, but among the Islamic people and the Arab people of the Middle East, do you know what is incredibly prominent still to this day? Dreams and vision of Jesus visiting with people. I have friends who've lived among those people, like in the middle of their cities, in the heart of their cities. I have one friend who is from Damascus. I have others who've lived and started CrossFit gems of all things but lived as missionaries and disciple makers, others who've taught in the schools and seminaries there, others who've lived among, and they all tell the same story of that those people say to them, before you showed up to talk to me, Jesus visited me in a dream. Listen, he's not done writing that story. No more than he's done writing Israel's story, which we read about two weeks ago when we read Romans 11, that God is now using the Gentiles to give that message back again to the Jews, Paul writes in Romans 11. He is still writing this story. He's still opening our eyes. He's still opening their eyes. And I love what it says. Verse 20, what, is the, what are the first words there? God was with the boy. And he grew. He settled in the wilderness, became an archer. He settled in the wilderness of Paran. And his mother got a wife for him from the land of Egypt. One thing I didn't mention, flip back to 16, because this is really interesting. Did you notice in verse in chapter 16, verse 14, it says, That's why she named the spring a well of the living one who sees me. It's located between Kadesh and Barad. If you don't know geography of that region very well, you may not remember that one of the key moments for the people after they left the exodus from Egypt was at Kadesh Barnea. Do you remember what happened there? It's a moment where they had to choose, and they didn't choose well. And many of them were not allowed into the promised land. And it's so intriguing that in that same region of the world, almost near the same place, based upon how this describes, here we see Hagar recognizing God and his promise to her and trusting enough to at least return, tell the story to Abraham, to Abram, because he then names the kid Ishmael, right? The angel didn't visit Abram. So here's Hagar going back and telling this story, believing the promise of God, which Abram and Sarah had not believed, and later at that same spot, the people who came out of Egypt would not believe the promise of God. And yet she did. Here's what I don't want you to hear. I'm not saying anything against Israel, for Israel, in the sense of like, you should go out of here and we only should think about Israel or think about, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm trying to help us understand, Israel is a chosen nation. They are and have, they do have the favor of God. And we don't want to mess with Israel. There's so many promises that say, don't mess with Israel. I get it. And yet there's similar promises made here to Ishmael and his descendants. And we see God throughout the scriptures writing them into the story too. How? Because Jesus and his gospel and his death on the cross and his resurrection from a tomb offers that resurrection life 
to anyone who would see that God is with us. And he's still inviting us into that today. In closing, I hope we'll wrestle with that, with who is God for. And we would understand that he's not finished with his mission and his message among the Jews, among the Arabs, or among the Gentiles. And there's two really interesting prophecies that help us see this. One is in Isaiah 9. I'll read these two in closing. In Isaiah 9, verse 1, it says, Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times, when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he'll bring honor to the way of the sea, to the land of the east of the Jordan, and to Galilee of the nations. I mean, he is describing that region in the language there. And he says, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation, the one that he covenanted with Abraham, and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time and as they rejoice when dividing spoils. For you've shattered their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For the trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He'll reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And then in Zechariah, Zechariah 2, it says, I looked up and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered, to measure Jerusalem, to determine its width and length. Then the angel who was speaking with me went out, and another angel went out to meet him. He said to him, run and tell this young man, Jerusalem will be inhabited without walls because of the number of people and livestock in it. The declaration of the Lord, I will be a wall of fire around it, and I will be the glory within it. Get up. Leave the land of the north. This is the Lord's declaration. For I've scattered you like the four winds. This is the Lord's declaration. Go, Zion. Escape, you who are living with daughter Babylon. For the Lord of hosts says this. He has sent me for his glory against the nations who are plundering you. For anyone who touches you touches the pupil of his eye. I will move against them with my power. They will become plunder for their own servants Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Daughter Zion, shout for joy and be glad, for I am coming to dwell among you. This is the Lord's declaration. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord on that day and become my people. I will dwell among you and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And so I just, I say this, God's still writing this story, and he sees you, and he's with you, and he sees Israel, and he's with Israel, and as crazy as it sounds, right now on the face of our planet, the number one revival that most missiologists are talking about 
you know where it's happening? You're in. He is seeing you still. And he is with us. And he's still writing this story. And as crazy as it may sound, he is writing it here. And he's not done here. And the mission and the message of God are bigger than one church, one people, one nation. They're about his fame and his glory and his honor. And so our invitation today is very simple. Will you respond and just say, Jesus, write me into that story. And he will remind me what I see every day. God's ready to do that. And I know he is, because that's what he has been doing, is doing, and will keep doing. And so that Zechariah passage is for you. That Isaiah passage was the first time. And that Zechariah passage is for you. And he's still writing the plot twist and the figuring the story out. Let's be a part. Father, thanks for what you do, that you are God with us and that you see us and help us, Lord, to know that you love us. This is not about us, our preferences, our ways. This is about your mission and your message. And we would be so glad surrender. Thanks for welcoming us and drafting us into your people. Your family is mine. Your glory name and honor is ours. Even right here in this room for those that are behind. We pray in your name. Jason, the God who sees and the God who hears is Emmanuel, the God with us. And as we uh, in our Advent season next week and and begin to anticipate the coming of Jesus, we want to start just thinking about that today. And we're going to sing a Christmas carol today, uh, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. But, you know, these aren't just songs that we sing every Christmas season, but it's songs that uh, remind us that we can rejoice that Emmanuel shall come to thee. O Israel. So let's stand and sing this together.
for singing with us. You can be seated. I uh, just want to remind you of a couple of things coming up uh, this week. First off, our uh, Wednesday Bible study will be back on Wednesday this week. We had our Wednesday on a Tuesday this past week as part of our um, Thanksgiving holiday, but we'll be back on Wednesday. That'll be Wednesday at 11 a.m. Uh, in the CLC. Uh, you can also join us online. Uh, so we'd love for you to join us here in the Fireside Room uh, on Wednesday for our Wednesday Bible study. Uh, then also, I want to remind you guys about our ladies' Christmas party. This is this Saturday, and uh, there's a sign-up sheet out in the lobby, so if you'd like to join us, there are a few guarantees in life, but one thing I can tell you is I've never heard anybody say they've had a bad time at a party that our fellowship team put on. So I know this will be a good time for all the ladies, so I hope you'll join us this Saturday uh, for our Christmas party. Uh, that's at 1130 this Saturday morning, so make sure to sign up if you haven't already out in the lobby. Um, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, this coming Sunday, we'll start our Advent. We'll have our candles up, and uh, we'll have our first Sunday of Advent next week. Uh, but we do want to sing a couple of Christmas carols. Uh, we did one just a minute ago. We'll sing another in just a minute. So I'll slide over to the keyboard, and we're going to close our service today uh, with one other song, uh, Emmanuel. So would you stand as we sing together? Let me pray to dismiss us, and then we'll sing our last song together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Uh, God, we thank you that the God who sees, the God who hears, God, you are here with us, Emmanuel. So as we think about that word, Emmanuel, and all that it means for us uh, today and this season, God, we just thank you for being here with us, uh, here uh, to Nashville, in Nashville as it is in heaven, God. We just thank you that you're here with us. And everywhere we go and everything that we do, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing together. Have a great week.